Okay, this recording is based upon a specification for a common emitter amplifier. We designed this in the last class, um, last Friday. So, um, what we're going to try and do is I'm going to try and roll you through the design process. Uh, we arrived at this specification in the class. We wanted some different numbers. So in this case our supply voltage is 12 volts, our emitter is a tenth of that, we're running quite hot at 20 milliamps, that's quite a large base, uh, uh, bias current. We're using the 10 base currents and we're using maximum symmetrical um, uh, swing for the design. Beta's 130 and our VBE is 0.7. So first thing in sketching our voltages is we want to know why the supply is, VCC. That's at 12 volts. Our emitter is at VE and that's at 1.2 volts. Now the best place to put the collector is in the middle of those two values. So the ideal thing to do is to draw a centre line right in the middle and that's establishing the value VC. Uh, 12 plus 1.2 um, divided by 2 gives us the um, midpoint value, 6.6 .6 volts. That gives us maximum symmetrical swing. So the top part is VRC, then we have VCE, and at the bottom we have VE. That's how we are using all of our power supply, our 12 volts. We're splitting it in lots of different ways. So 6.6 .6 volts is the value for VC. That's what we're actually going to use in our design calculations. This diagram should help you ensure you get everything correct. Now here's the circuit diagram that we have all, that I designed um, in the class, and then I've put that already into WARCAD. I've put a load resistance on here, which we don't need to consider. We can almost ignore that one. My power supply is out of the way in the top corner there as well. My input signal is just some arbitrary value I've chosen, 108 millivolts. I'll show you why later. Um, I've used an arbitrary transistor from the reference library, so the value of beta of this transistor is wrong, but it's close enough for it to actually work in the design. So, what we're going to do first is we're going to calculate the value of RE, the emitter resistance. Now in this case, the emitter resistance is made up of two resistors. So RE1 and RE2 are RE. Okay. So, where do we start? We need to calculate this uh, value. The obvious thing to start with is the emitter voltage is VCC upon 10 in our specification. Now the supply voltage was 12, therefore the emitter voltage is 12 over 10, 1.2 volts. Okay, so if we do that, we've now got a relatively small value for the emitter. The collector current is approximately the same as the emitter current if beta is significantly large, which it is, so we can say that the emitter current is 20 milliamps, the same as the base. So RE total, the total bias resistance, is 1.2 volts, divided by 20 milliamps. And then I believe that number comes out, oh, oh sorry, just as a note here, whenever I'm writing things down I often write 20 e minus 3, that stands for 20 exponential form 10 to the power minus 3. That's the quickest way of writing and making it logical. I think some of you get mistakes on the calculator. I've got 55.85 and 4.15, so I've got 60 ohms, which is exactly what you would get there. So the total resistance is 60 ohms. Next thing to move on to is the supply uh, is the value of RC. The supply voltage minus the collector voltage divided by the current gives you RC. So our supply is set up as 12 volts minus the 6.6 .6 where we're setting it over 20 milliamps. That gives us our um, our collector load resistance, and I believe on the circuit diagram that was 270 ohms. Let's just check. Yes, that's right, 270. Let's write that one in. Okay, so we've designed the emitter, we've designed the collector. Now what we need to do is we need to design the lower bias resistor and the upper bias. Now we're using the 10 base currents method, which is a relatively straightforward and logical method um, where we have to have at least 10 base currents in the bias network. 
Let me show you on the circuit diagram. We've got one base current going into the transistor. We need 10 base currents going into the lower bias transistor for bias to be effective. Therefore, if you've got 10 plus 1, in the top upper bias resistor, you've got 11 base currents. Kirchhoff's current law has to be obeyed. This is one of the reasons this method is simple and also accurate. On the emitter, we've got an emitter voltage of VE. We've got VBE, so we've got a base voltage, VBB, of 1.2 plus 0.7. So let's calculate my lower bias resistor. RL is equal to VC, uh, VE, the emitter voltage, plus VBE, the base emitter voltage, divided by 10 base currents. Now I don't like talking in base current terms, I always like thinking about the collector current. So if I put 10 collector currents, I have to divide by beta, so I'll put the beta on the top. So there's my nice tidy expression. So if we plug in all the numbers now, we've got 1.2 volts at the emitter, 0.7 volts at the base, times 130 the value of beta, over 10 multiplied by 20 milliamps. Okay, 20e minus 3. If we do a quick calculation on that, we'll find out what the lower bias resistor is. Sorry, I've just checked my notes on where I was calculating that value, and we are at 1.1 1 .1 volts. One point two three five kilo ohms. Okay, so there's my lower bias resistor. Should have had my notes to hand earlier. So let's calculate the upper bias resistor. R U is the supply voltage VCC minus VE minus VBE. Okay, that's the absolute voltage at the base multiplied by beta divided by eleven times the collector current. Okay, so if you plug in all the numbers, we've got 12 minus 1.2 minus 0.7 multiplied by 130 over 11 times 20e minus 3, 20 milliamps. Okay, now this one's uh, a little bit easier to hand. This one is uh, 5, uh, 5. Point, is it 5.65? Let me just check. Five point nine six k. That's the one. Okay. So we've now got the two bias resistors. We've got the collector resistor and the emitter resistor all designed. So now we can really move on in our design processes. So we've designed on the circuit diagram. I always like to tick these off: the upper and the lower bias, the collector resistance, and RE. We're obviously going to now need to calculate the values for RE one and for RE two because those are splitting the emitter resistance to calculate gain or the actual bias level. Now what I'm going to do first, I'm actually going to have a look at the small signal equivalent model to calculate the equation for gain. So here is our transistor. We've got the base, the collector and the emitter. Okay. We're connecting the emitter through RE1 and we're connecting the collector through RC down to ground. At the base, we connect the supply and to ground. So there's two resistors here in parallel with each other. RU is in parallel with RL. There's my input signal V in, here's my output signal V out. And here, this current source in the transistor is IB beta, and IB is the current that's flowing into the base. So now we've got this, we can effectively calculate, or we can write out an equation for the gain of this circuit. AV is V out over V in, so let's write out an expression for V out. V out in this terms is simply the current source multiplied by resistance. Ohm's law. Current times resistance equals voltage. Current 
is, is going in the same direction as voltage, so it's minus IB beta multiplied by my resistance, in this case, RC. Okay, very easy. We've calculated V out. Now let's calculate V in. V in has got two parts, because when you look at V in, some energy is going into the bias network, but we can ignore that. We don't care about that lost energy. What we do care about is where V in is composed of. Effectively, that's split over the resistor RBE, as you can see here, and RE1. So we've got a volt drop across RE and a volt drop across uh, RE1. Now, if we remember that RBE came from the T model, it's 1 plus beta RE. That's where it came from. RE is VT, thermal voltage, over the emitter current. Again, so we now know that value, and VT is K, Boltzmann's constant, T, temperature in Kelvin, Q, charge on an electron, and as an engineer, we always approximate it to 25 millivolts. So let's plug in RBE in those longer terms, 1 plus beta RE. So we've got IB, 1 plus beta RE, is the volt drop across the top resistor, and then we've got IB uh, going in, and we've got IB beta going in to the emitter resistance, so that resistor is magnified. So effectively we've got IB brackets 1 plus beta brackets RE1. And there we go. Um, so we've now got V out and we've got V in. So if we just divide those two equations together, we can see what cancels because there's an awful lot of the same term in everything. So where do we start? IB is in every term, so it cancels. Beta and beta plus 1 are basically the same value, so they cancel. So we're now left with gain AV is minus RC over little re plus RE1. This is a fundamental equation which shows us the gain when you have a feedback. So it's not the maximum gain of the circuit, it's gain that's controlled. And we're controlling it with the value of RE1. So, how do we do that on the circuit diagram? We have to deploy the split emitter technique. Normally we'd have a resistor down to ground and we'd bypass the whole thing with a capacitor, CE. If we did so, we would have the maximum possible gain for the circuit because effectively the gain equation would have RE1 as zero. So that's maximum gain, the largest that you can have. If we want to control the gain to have a lower value than that maximum, what we do is we split the emitter resistance into two parts. So here's the circuit diagram. We've got two resistors, RE1 and RE2. RE1 and RE2 together make RE my bias condition. Okay, so together they make the bias, but RE1 and RE2 split. RE2 is short-circuited by the capacitor, RE1 sets the gain. So we've now divorced the gain from the bias, which is exactly what we wanted to do. So split emitter uh, allows us to do this. So let's work out what the value now is that we need for our RE1 to do our calculations. Let's have a look at our circuit diagram. Okay, our, oh, our specification was supposed to say at the top here that we had um, a value of AV equals 50. Okay, um, we didn't set that in there, but just looking at the numbers inside here, I think that was exactly what we'd set. I forgot to write that down at the top. So, I'll just make a note, AV equals 50. Okay, that was part of our specification. So, scrolling down through all this work that we've already done, we're now going to use this equation, and we're going to use this split emitter to calculate our value. So, AV equals minus RC over RE plus RE1. I suppose the first thing to do is to actually calculate um, the value for RE. We know AV... 50. We know RC, 270. We can calculate RE, the little RE, and then we will find the value of RE1 resistance. 
Re is Vt, thermal voltage, over emitter current, which in this case is 25 millivolts. So I've left the milli off over 20 milliamps. I've left the milli off 20 over 25. Okay, so this is a very small resistor. Okay, when you actually do the calculations, you're only looking at 1.25 ohms for the emitter resistance. That's because we're burning quite a lot of current here. 20 milliamps is quite large. If we rearrange that expression, we cross multiply RE plus RE1 and AV. So we can write RE1 is equal to RC, the collector load resistance, divided by AV minus RE. Now if you notice the minus sign on RC is gone because I'm just using magnitude for AV. So I've got 270 over 50 minus 1.25 that gives me my resistance of 4.15 ohms, I think. Yes. So there's my first emitter resistance done. My total resistance, RE, or RE tot, was 60 ohms. So 60 minus 4.15 gives us 55.85 ohms. So that's splitting the emitter into two parts. Together they make the bias. The 4.15 ohm resistors sets the gain. So now if I go back to my schematic diagram, I can tick off what I've done. I've now done um, the emitter resistance 1 and the emitter resistance 2. So effectively my, my design is now complete. But all the work on the exam questions not complete. There's more to do. We've calculated RE total. Nice and simple. That's the first start. We've calculated RC. We've calculated the lower and the upper bias resistors. We've deduced and derived the, the small signal equivalent gain circuit. Again, that's very important knowing how to do that because we've effectively calculated the equation for AV rather than just remembering it or remembering it wrong. We've worked out how we split the emitter to control the gain and we can specify effectively the values of the two resistors that make up the total bias. So here's AllCAD giving me a simulation. The red waveform on here is my output characteristic from the circuit. The green waveform is my input to the circuit. So you can see there's some considerable gain there. I'm using AllCAD to do evaluate, evaluate measurements. So I found out that the maximum peak signal coming out of the signal is 4.266 volts. Um, I've labelled the node on the circuit with a label, a wire label, called Vout, so it makes it easy to find. My input signal, 108 millivolts. And I've also calculated here output over input, so I've actually calculated gain directly. So I've got a gain of 39.5, and I was supposed to have a gain of 50. So something's probably gone a little bit wrong in what I've done, or it's a starting point for my design. It doesn't really matter at the moment, because we've gone through the right methodology. Probably because we were burning hot, we're close, but not close enough. Let's just explain dynamic range. Now, one of the reasons I asked you to draw that circuit, the uh, voltage plots, was so that you understood where the range of the signal was. The supply voltage is 12 volts, the emitter voltage is 1.2 volts, and the collector sits in the middle. So my dynamic range is a signal between those two points. In this case, we're looking at 10.8 volts, 12 minus 1.2. We're centered on 6.6, .6 and we can't go anywhere below 1.2 in our collector. So we can express that dynamic range as a signal peak to peak. Our voltage gain is 50. That was our specification. I know we haven't actually achieved 50, but that doesn't matter here. V out peak to peak, 10.8 volts. Okay. And that's the largest, what is the largest input signal that we can have that will then give us the largest output signal at 10.8 volts. So effectively what we're doing here is the next line on this, uh, on this question. We're trying to determine the largest input signal. So V in peak to peak is equal to V out peak to peak divided by AV. So if we've got 10.8 volts divided by 50, we end up with our peak to peak input signal of 216 millivolts. 
Now, often you don't deal with peak to peak, but it's easy to see on the diagram. You might deal with peak voltages like you would do with AUCAD. So that will be a 108 millivolt peak signal. Okay, notice the hat symbol. That's why I had 108 millivolts going into the circuit at the very beginning. So you can see how we've tied that two together. We've asked you a little bit of a, a simple question about what's happening inside that design. Now, I'm going to ask you something even more complicated now. What's the input impedance to this amplifier circuit? Well, one of the reasons I got you to draw out the small signal equivalent model is that once you've drawn it out, you actually can understand what's happening in the design. We've got the upper and lower bias resistors at the very input of our transistor. We've then got two components in the model, RBE, the base emitter resistance, which we know is 1 plus beta RE, the emitter resistance. And we've got RE1, which is effectively an amplified version of that resistance. Why is it amplified? Well, you've only got the base current flowing in from the input, but you've also got the collector current flowing in. So Z in is an equation we can calculate. Let's try and write out what that equation is going to look like then, because we've got all these components inside here now. So Z in is equal to RU in parallel with RL. Okay, That's the first component on this diagram. That is then in parallel with the combination of RBE and RE1. Okay, So that's quite important. A lot of people have made mistakes by adding them together. The two resistors RBE and RE1 are in parallel with RU and RL. So it's quite a complicated parallelized circuit. Now, RE1 is going to be magnified by the current that's flowing in IB and the current IB beta. So RE1 behaves like it is RE1 times 1 plus beta. So here we've got the parallel equation now. So we've got RU in parallel with RL in parallel with 1 plus beta RE plus 1 plus beta RE1. So that looks quite messy in the circuits, doesn't it? No, it looks like quite a complicated design. We'll break it down into little stages after we've simplified. We've got RU in parallel with RL, the two bias components, in parallel with 1 plus beta RE plus RE1. Okay, Same terms. So it's quite straightforward when you actually look at it like this. So if we take those into little par in parts, okay, and calculate what's actually happening, we can look at the RU and RL resistance first, and then we can look at uh, the RE and RE1. So let's take these two terms, RU and RL. 1.2K, or 1.235K, in parallel with 5.96K gives us just over 1k, 1.035, uh, 1.3 kilo ohms. So that's the two resistors in the bias network. Now we need to consider the other. 1 plus beta is 131, multiplied by RE1, which was a very small resistor. I believe that was, what, 1.25 ohms, plus RE1, the outside, 4.15 ohms. So those are small resistors, but when they're multiplied by 131, they become a little bit larger. So this is a 707.4 ohms resistor. So those two impedances that we just found are in parallel with each other. So you've got 1K in parallel with 700 ohms. When you put those two together, do product over sum or whichever you choose, you've got 418.2 ohms. So we think the input impedance to this amplifier is 418 ohms. Now, why am I doing that? I'm doing that for a number of reasons, because I want to establish what that impedance is, and now I'm going to use it, okay? I'm going to use it inside uh, and, and look at the effect of the coupling capacitance. So we have a sine wave source through a coupling capacitor into an input impedance. Okay, now immediately you should look at that and start to think this is a high pass filter with a coupling capacitor 
an input voltage source, a sine wave, and an output uh, and an input impedance, Z in. Okay, so it's high pass in design. Now we could go through the maths of a high pass, but it's not really relevant to do that here. We can just remember the expression. The break frequency for a high pass is one over two pi R C. Okay, in this case R is Z in, and C is the coupling capacitor. Okay. So if you plug in some numbers in this one, we've got 1 over 2 pi r is now my z, 418.2 ohms, multiplied by my coupling capacitor. Now, better just check what I put on my schematic diagram. Ooh, now on my schematic diagram, I've changed my, I've changed my uh, capacitor. Um, that's 100 microfarads. I think when we did this in the class, we didn't use 100 microfarads. I think we used 1 microfarad. So I think there's a difference of opinion here between what I've calculated and what we actually put down. So let's put in what we did in the class. 1 microfarad, 1 e minus 6. Let's calculate the number. And in doing so, we end up with 380 hertz. Okay. So we really are thinking about this circuit here. So we think all signals below 380 hertz will be attenuated by that coupling capacitor. So here's a quick sketch of what I'm expecting in log frequency terms. This is log frequency axis. Uh, let's just put some labels on here. 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. Let's put that one there. 380 hertz is about 4, and that's roughly in the middle of a decade, maybe a little bit over to one side. So I'm estimating this line here is where we are at uh, for 380 hertz. And I think that's just gone off the bottom of the uh, page in this diagram. So if I now plot the pass band for my high pass filter and the attenuation, we'll see what's happening. My voltage gain at this magnitude is a voltage gain of 50. I know we've only achieved 40, but that doesn't matter. Okay, That's just a calculation or a, an empirical value that's not quite happened. So here's my pass band, and here's the attenuation in the uh, as we go into the stop band. Okay, So we can see we've got a high pass performance. <clears throat> 20 dBs below a gain of 50. So not negative 20 dBs, but 20 dBs lower, we should be one decade below. So that would be at 38 hertz. <clears throat> now, what do we have? If we look at a gain of 50 in decibel terms, we can calculate what that dB magnitude actually is. Well, when you did filters, you only had 0 dB and you had attenuation. Here we're going to have gain uh, and then an attenuation. So 20 log the base 10 of 50 gives me 33.9 decibels. Let's put that on the top here. So a gain of 50 is 33.9 and therefore a reduction by 20 dBs is 13.9 dBs. So you can see we're obeying a high pass filter exactly as you would expect. So Z in has been a very useful quick calculation for us as to what's happening inside our design. Let's have a look at what ORCAD tells us. And here we are. ORCAD is telling us in the passband we've got about 33, 34 dBs of gain. Exactly what you would expect from that gain. As you roll off in the stop band, we're looking like we're dropping 20 dBs per decade. So it's looking very much like a high pass filter. If we extrapolate those two and see where they cross, we're calculating the value of the uh, the break frequency, around 380 hertz. That doesn't show up at all, does it? So it's somewhere close to that 380. Now, if we do ORCAD and do some measurements, we can use an evaluation tool, uh, cut off high pass, and we put the output node in. It's calculated 314.6 hertz. Okay, So you can see that we're not exactly correct, but in analogue, we make lots of approximations and we get close to the design. And that's what we've managed to do here. So here's our full circuit in operation with all the bias conditions actually annotated on. Our collector current's 19.71 milliamps 
and we aimed for 20 milliamps. Okay, so we're very close. We aimed for 6.6 .6 volts bias, we we're at 6.67 bias. So again, we're close on the bias of the design. So this circuit is doing exactly as you would expect it to behave. Notice I labeled the input V in and the output V out. It made it really easy to analyze on the circuit diagram. Okay, so it's quite a nice little design when you roll through all of these features. So there's a lot of work here. This gives you an example of the level of complexity, what you should understand for transistor amplifier design, going step by step through the puzzle that we actually had a look at inside the lecture. Hope this little video helps.